Josh Hayes, they'll be tackling tough industry topics, asking even tougher questions, all to find better solutions as they try to make sense make sense. Thank you for tuning in to Sense Per Mile. I'm your host, Charles Gracie. And I'm your co-host, Paul Gibson. Hey, I'm Josh Haynes, and I will be your broker for today. Uh, what are we talking about, guys, on today's episode? We're talking about small carriers trying to be big. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things. It's a, it's a crazy space to navigate, uh, especially after last year, which we'll definitely get into. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough space. Um, and, obviously, you have to operate in a way that you can't operate like a mega carrier. But, like, how, how do you gather market share you know, how do you decide how to grow? Do you grow that kind of thing? So, yeah, I mean, before we hop into that, our sponsors for today are CDL Life and Hot Seat Services. Check them out. Um, so it's uh, if you're watching this, it's Wednesday. If you're watching this when it airs and uh, we're about to be at Matt's. As a matter of fact, after we get done here, that's what we're going to do. So if you're going to be at Matt's, uh, come say hi. We'll be we'll be around for sure. Look for Josh, who's going to look like he's applying for a broker outfit. Applying for it, I am it. All right, gentlemen, let's let's move on uh, to our first topic, which is uh, ten two news. All right, so it's time for ten two news. So we scour through CDL Life and see what the coolest articles are, or like the most interesting articles articles from the uh, the past couple of weeks. Um, so the first article is in British Columbia. Um, Basically, they're trying to or did pass a law that essentially uh, would allow fines for up to one hundred thousand dollars and or eighteen months in prison for trucks that strike bridges. Give me the eighteen months on that one, man. One hundred k. That's almost a truck payment. <laughs> that, that, that's a truck. Like, come on. Well, I mean, I think it depends on if you're doing lease purchase or not. That might be half. Well, at least purchase, you might not ever actually get the purchase. But either way, dude, like 18 months, like, I mean, I don't know. We're from, me and Josh are from Kansas City. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the infamous Independence Avenue Bridge. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people getting put away, you know, that that by itself, I feel like, you know, that that could that could cause a driver shortage. Yeah, well, and a prison availability shortage because it's like, come on, this happens all the time. And Joliet, Illinois, they got the bridge that they there's literally trucking terminals right there, and they hit the bridge and they see it every day. Yep, they're definitely gonna have to start paying those oversized guys more. <laughs> now, our second couple stories is is a little bit more serious note than we usually try to have on the show, um, but it, it's kind of a topic that's near and dear to me. They found a driver uh, passed away in his truck after no one had heard from him for two days. Uh, they don't really expect foul play. It's under investigation. Um, but he was there for two days, dead in his truck. Yeah. And then, well, but then a week later, <laughs> the same thing happened in Nebraska. And, and the interesting thing is they're, they're reporting on it, but like this happens. Like I even lost a friend earlier this year. Like he had a heart attack in his truck and no one heard from him for a couple days. Like that just goes to show like, how alone you are out on the road and how much of a weight physically on, on your health that this job takes. Oh, it's mentally and physically stressful. Um, I've been there. I've done it. And there's not a lot of solutions out there. I mean, you got people out there advocating it for a healthier lifestyle, healthier choices, workout routines. But they ask, actually have to find time to do this stuff. And the only time they can divert to exercise at all is their own. So, I mean, it just shows how slanted this whole thing is. And uh, we as an industry need to do better in uh, two days. Like, man, I didn't have a dispatcher not talk to me at least three times a day. Well, I mean, not just that, though, but it also shows some of the disconnection, too. Like, I mean, you know, if you if you passed away at your desk, someone would know within an hour, maybe three tops um you know like that's that's just it's it's insane and drivers drivers are out there in that box on their own it's not regulated you know like the nobody nobody has to get the body home that's why things like uh trucker's final mile and and tier exists which is crazy that we have to have a, a fundraiser to get drivers home after they pass away on the road right and most of them that exist don't have the like can't maintain funding and most of them are operated by drivers and like that's it's just a sad state of things but anyway 
Um, that being said, it's time for Behind the Wheel. All right, so it's time for Behind the Wheel. So we uh, here at CDL Life have access to the largest driver audience in the world, and we ask drivers questions so we can get real opinions from real drivers about real issues. Uh, and so today, talking about small carriers and, and finding success as a small carrier um, and, you know, the troubles they go through, we decided to ask, do you think it's easier or harder than it used to be to find a small carrier slash mom and pop carrier to drive for and why? Um, so 13% said they think it's easier and a lot of them pretty much unanimously cited the Internet. You know, you used to have to look at a newspaper, so you can definitely tell it's the people who've been around for a while. Um, 87% said harder. And a lot of the things that were that pointed out is insurance has put a lot of them out of business. They can't afford to keep up. Uh, regulations have put a lot of them in situations, you know, with like safety regulations and that kind of thing that they can't keep up with at that size. Uh, and then lastly, most can't deal with paying competitively due to freight rates from larger carriers who can charge less. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly what we're here to talk about. But in my experience as a driver and a recruiter on this, working with the smaller carriers is a lot easier from a hiring standpoint processes. They don't complicate a one car funeral, but. They are at a disadvantage because of those insurance companies, be because of the regulations put in place, uh, the tools that some of the bigger carriers deploy make the job easier, and they don't have access to those because of cost and all those other things that drive that profit and mar uh, loss margin for them. So they are starting off on a disadvantage right out the gate, uh, but yet they provide a better experience in my in my experience. Yep, and this leads directly into our main topic. So uh, I think it's time. So now we're here to make sense, make sense. And we're talking small carrier success. And Paul, you, you've worked with a lot of small carriers to help get the branding and the exposure they need to be relevant in a very competitive market. What's some of the experience you have there? Well, the, the interesting thing about small carriers is, you know, it, it's uh, small carriers for a lot of drivers are kind of like, uh, you know, long nose trucks. And the sense of like that that's kind of sought after and, and something you don't see as much anymore. They don't feel like exists as much anymore, even though they make up, I think, like 20 percent of all the power units on the road. Um, but it, it is harder to cut through that noise. It's hard for a mid-sized carrier to cut through the noise of the Internet. Um, so I think the, the big thing is is showing um, a lot of times your drivers that you do have, even if you're a small fleet, your drivers can speak to that. Um, cause typically most small carriers, especially with the insurance things they face are hiring experienced drivers who know how to explain the difference between working there and working at a mid-sized carrier. You're not just going to get the, they treat you like family. You're going to start getting the, this is why I work here. And then using your, your drivers to present that, um, as a small carrier typically holds a lot more weight than a large carrier where Drivers know that you're picking one person out of a thousand or out of 500. It's like, oh, you know, three out of 12 people that work there think this place is amazing. So what's really cool is, you know, you offer the insight of how to get them that exposure and that reach. And from a recruiting perspective on that, you know, that's an important component for them. Uh, but also from a recruiting perspective to help them get that reach, often companies like myself and Hot Seat Services are deployed to help them further their reach and their exposure within the driver market and get their offer out there. Um there's all kinds of little things that they can do that can help them get that big carrier approach, but cost is a big one for them. You know, when you're a smaller carrier, one truck, if you got three trucks and one goes down, those other two are barely able to pull that margin to keep you in the black versus being in the red. And if something happens on those trucks and it's a law of averages, it could be the difference between a bad month or bad quarter, depending on what went wrong. And we all know that the old, saying that no one's going to take care of it the same way you will. That's true in these small carriers. I remember what my dad with his fleet of trucks. He taught me that at an early age. The way he took care of his truck is not the same expectation he could have for his people. He hoped to have it, but he learned that wasn't the case. So there's just all kinds of obstacles that go into that. And working with these accessorial services can help further their reach, can help further their brand. But cost 
it has to be cost efficient. It has to make sense for them. So how do they sift through all of that noise? And that's one of the things where you've worked with them on the video capacity, helping get them branding, giving them their bang for their buck on that end. I've worked with them on the recruiting side of things to try to, you know, make sure that they get the best of the best because a bad driver can make or break their entire operation at that size. Well, and I, I think a lot of that also depends on intent. Are they a small carrier who's trying to grow or do they want to stay about where they're at, you know, cause they got stuff locked down. And most of the time when it comes to advertising, you know, if you're, if you're at, you know, a set amount of drivers and you want to stay small, like word of mouth is everything. And a lot of times it turns into a club, you know, it's like, Oh man, I love to work there. Oh, well, all the trucks are full. Uh, but if anything happens, we'll let you know. And a lot of times when I've approached companies that size about advertising that don't have an intent to grow, they say no, because if we start putting branding and stuff like that out, out there everywhere, um, we're going to have more applications than we know what to do with. So so let's talk about this a little bit. So what are the perks of being a smaller carrier? Well, in the recruiting side of things, we look at what the wins are. And the wins for a smaller carrier, they're very personalized. Generally, when there's a small carrier, everyone knows everyone. Everyone knows the boss. It's an open-door policy. And without sounding cliche, it does feel like a family. Um, but they also paint clearer expectations. Uh, generally, when I'm working with a smaller carrier, they are not scared to go out there and say, you are not a good fit. They will stay away from a bad hire because they know that could dictate success or failure. Um, you also have a more direct route as far as the relationship between you and the ops team. It's no longer, hey, this person's got 50 people they're trying to plan for. They generally have a smaller group, so it's more personalized. The relationships are stronger. These are some of the wins with being a smaller carrier that if you can communicate these out there, they're going to help you. So we got some exciting guests coming on to talk about different aspects of it. And I think we should hop into it. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the coolest part is that, you know, like, in my experience, you remove a lot of the bureaucracy and those small carriers, the people in the office are actually empowered by the owner. Uh, but that being said, speaking of bureaucracy, uh, we have a guest to talk about uh, safety with small carriers right after the break. Hot Seat Services has rent a recruiter. Wait! Hey, Michael, have you heard that Hot Seat Services rent a recruiter service will place their staff in your organization similar to a temporary hire model? No way, what else does it do? Follow me, I have to tell everyone. They take leads in existing databases to put new hires into your business's trucks. Well, shit, I'm in timbers! What else? Come on! Their model is more cost efficient because their recruiters are trained and can get your pipeline flowing easier and faster. No way. Anything else? No matter how many hires they make, it's a set cost per week, so the more they get, the better their client's cost per hire gets. Holy sh**. For more information and to find out for yourself, go to hotseatservices.com. All right, we're back. And right now we're with Sam Watts. He's the safety supervisor with MyBorg Brothers, Inc. Sam, welcome to Sense Per Mile. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, uh, it's an honor to be here. Is that too much? I feel like that was too much. But it's it's great. <laughs> Our heads might not fit through the door after the show now. <laughs> I'm happy to be. I've I've seen the show, uh, I, and I've I've talked to both of you guys. So I'm just happy that it all worked out, and we could chat on here. Well, speaking of making it all work out, we're talking about how smaller carriers can be successful and kind of gear themselves towards being bigger carriers, and you know, safety and planning comes into that. So, tell us a little bit about what you see there. Yeah, so safety is an interesting thing when it comes to trucking because uh, there's so many different levels that you have to have when it comes to, like operations and HR and and accounting. Like as you grow a company, uh, you kind of morph with that. But with safety, safety is the exact same if you have one truck versus if you have ten thousand trucks. I mean, a lot of times smaller carriers will get themselves into trouble with safety because they they think because they're small that no one's going to notice them but the the fmcsa sees you just the same way uh if you're one truck versus you know like i said ten thousand trucks so um safety it's it's so important to have a, a very solid base with safety when you're small and if you plan on growing then then you already have that foundation laid it's just like anything like any good business you have to have that foundation laid and then you can grow the safety department and and as the trucks come and and you build your fleet up your safety should 
be able to maintain everything if you have that that good base. If you have that proper discipline when it comes to safety when you're small, uh, you know, make sure your driver qualification files are right, making sure that you're paying attention to your CSA uh, percentages and making sure that you're you're staying under that, making sure your equipment is good. Uh, if you have bad equipment when you're small, you're going to have even worse equipment when you're big. That's just my opinion. Uh, but if you don't take that maintenance piece seriously when you're small, and I get it. I, I was part of a small fleet for a number of years. That maintenance when you're a small fleet is a killer uh, just because – it's so expensive. And, and it was, I'm talking a couple of years ago, it's even more now. Uh, and so a lot of guys will try to kind of push that away or, okay, we'll get down the road and then we'll figure it out. But man, it's just, the more you put it off, the more it accumulates. And all of a sudden now you're looking at a $10,000 bill and your truck is blown up somewhere uh, and you can't move. So it's, it's when you're small, it's so important to get that discipline factor down first, lay that foundation. And then as you grow your fleet, your foundation will grow with you. If you have if, if it's good now i imagine a lot of that comes down to cost and manpower and resources so if i'm a small fleet and i have questions i'm probably looking for a place to where, where to get those answers i mean what's some of your recommendations as far as content goes or places they can seek some of these answers me, you, you, me. I'm the I'm the answer guy. That's all there is to it. Uh, no, I. They, it, that's a fun thing. <laughs> I lined you up there. I'll bill you later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. No, yeah. Just reach out to me. Uh, no, there's there's a a bunch of great content out there, and it's so I, I love the internet. I love what we're doing with it, and I love that trucking is now starting to embrace technology because for so many years it did it. And I I might date myself here a little bit, uh, but I started in trucking in the late nineties. So, I mean, I've been a part of the industry for a long time here now, and and I know what you're thinking, Sam. You couldn't possibly be that old. I am, but thank you for the compliment. Uh, but it's 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 so nice that trucking has evolved now, and there's so much content out there. There's so many good people uh, that are focusing on that on making safety stuff. The nice thing is is that there's a lot of technology out there now that is helping in the safety department. You know, no longer are you having to manually remember uh, expiration dates and oh, do I have uh, a valid CDL in the guy's driver qualification file. We have all this uh, technology now, and I'm not going to name any names because no one's sponsoring me yet, but there are a lot of good programs out there that will keep track of all that. So, you know, it, it used to be where the safety guy, you, you could only have so many trucks under him because he'd have just so much stuff he'd have to keep track of. Well, now you can add more trucks and keep the same amount of personnel to a certain degree uh, because there's so much more technology that, that is helping out. I mean, just I'm not even really going to go into dash cams even, but I mean, just the amount of, of dash cam footage that I have now that that has saved me probably hundreds of thousands of dollars in insurance claims and, and even uh, legal issues. It's unbelievable how much it has caught up, the, the technology has caught up with it. And that's something that as a small company, it's easy to embrace because I believe, and this is just my opinion, that this technology is super cheap. I mean, you go to any like ELD factor or, or company and they will, I mean, it's like 40, 50 bucks a month per truck. That's really cheap to really help you guys out. So if someone wanted to get a hold of you to get some of these answers or some of this guidance, what's a good way that they can get a hold of you? Uh, basically LinkedIn. That's where I live. Uh, I know that's kind of maybe a cliche answer, but you can look me up on LinkedIn, Sam Watts. Uh, I've, I've got, uh, I've got a pretty good profile there. I've got a lot of people that really like me on there. Uh, and you should too, you should come on connect. I'm open to it all. Uh, also I, I try to hit up some trade shows. I'll be at Matt's. So if you're going to be there, come find me. Uh, and we can shake hands. I'll give you a hug if you're into that. Um, and if you're not cool, no, no, no pressure there, but, uh, yeah, I just LinkedIn is a great spot to find me at. Well, awesome. Thanks for coming on and sharing some of your knowledge and uh, look forward to seeing you at Matt's. Sounds good. Yeah. Speaking of being at Matt's, uh, so we actually, someone thought it would be a good idea, uh, to give us the stage on Saturday for about 45 minutes to talk and, uh, <laughs> and everybody's like what are we going to talk about what are we going to talk about so we decided to talk about why everything is wrong with the industry and what happened to make it that way um so and and this kind of is is an interesting uh to, to be talking about small carriers right before we do this uh because a lot of that's going to lead into that you know going all the way back to 1935 everything in the middle the 1980 etc um and the interesting thing is the way that the industry really has evolved is 
a lot of the problems stem from so much government oversight and insurance. Yeah, so I think it's important to talk about why we're talking about that because we, in order to address the issues in recruiting and the industry, we have to go back to where it all started. So that was kind of our approach here is to educate and bring light to those decisions that were made that led us to where we're at now and in the environment that we're in now. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of times, you know, we, we usually take the driver perspective and the driver experience uh, and present it to carriers as a way to talk about issues and then try to provide solutions. Um, but ultimately, there there is another side to the story that we don't get too much to too much is that carriers are very much a creature of the market that they're in. You know, they still have to navigate that while while doing it both ways. And there's different levels, and you know, there's different ethics and practices and stuff like that. Um, but it, it's really interesting to be talking about small carriers because they get the brunt of all of that. You know, if you if you have a large carrier and you implement a new regulation that requires some kind of new technology or new equipment that's required to be on the trucks, like, you know, when e-logs finally became a mandate um, and then they like got further mandated and the glider kit thing got even more weird. So you're telling me that the small carriers aren't out there rolling around in dough like G face over there on the brokerage side like that, that these things actually cost them money that they actually have to invest to keep running their business. It's insane. Right. But then like, they're also, they're also tied closer to the drivers and a lot of people who own small fleets drive themselves. Yeah. Insane. Right. So it's like, it's like seeing both sides of it. Um, and it's it, having to navigate both sides of it simultaneously. Um, which is why I think a lot of, you know, with the, 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 the freight market being the way it was last year, I think that's why you saw so many small carriers and owner operators fold under before you started seeing the domino effect and, and catching larger companies going down. Well, because they feel it faster. You know, we talked about how a lot of them were living off the cash reserves of when the market was good. And eventually that runs out. And when that runs out, that's where you start to see the fractures. Those things that you didn't pay attention to because you were raking in the money. And then as they become more prevalent, uh, they become pain points. Those fractures become fissures and then sinkholes. And eventually you lose your business to them. Uh, you know, we saw we covered a couple CDL life articles, people that were diversified on their income they were servicing one client that client folded they folded they had nowhere to go that well was dry so you take all these different compounding factors from government overreach to insurance rates going up to the market and to bad business practices yeah it compounds fast and these small carriers are the first ones to feel it so i think it's a great time to switch over to somebody to speak on this after this break too often, recruiters struggle to reach qualified applicants or prioritize which leads to contact. The answer to improving lead quality is amplifying driver intent by nurturing meaningful personal connections at the right time when the applicant is still engaged and interested in your position. What if lead nurturing was as simple as a trained professional proactively making contact with your applicant, confirming the candidate's interest, and connecting the driver to your recruiting line? Well, with the Intent Engine, it really can be. No answer? No problem. You'll never waste time dialing and redialing. We'll make multiple attempts to follow up with every candidate and automatically follow up with the full application details or a call to action to connect with your team via text message. Our custom intent engine solutions will achieve your company's unique goals from lead prioritization within your ATS to further nurturing or full app prioritization. 80% of drivers reached via the intent engine confirm interest in the position and are ready to connect with a recruiter immediately. Our intent solutions are changing the game when it comes to enabling recruiting teams to turn leads into genuine driver relationships. Well, we're back, and I have Jamie Hagen from Hellbent Express. Welcome to the show, Jamie. Hey, how's it going, fellas? I don't know. You tell me, man. You're out there. You're boots on the ground. You are a small carrier operator. Tell us what it's like out there and the pain points and what we got wrong and what everyone else is getting wrong. I'm nothing but a grain of sand on a beach is all I am. <laughs> You're right, getting getting washed away by the uh, the economy, right? Like I don't know. Wait, you're not raking in money? No, no. As it turns out, it's it's a lot harder than it looks. Um, yeah, I don't know. We're struggling like everybody else, fighting like everybody else. Uh, you know, uh, not much there other than the fact that it's 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 all bleak. You know, 
nothing <laughs> no good news it's all bad news and we just keep plugging away you just that's trucking though isn't it i mean you guys got a shout out from congress that should make you feel better and make all the problems go away <laughs> <laughs> no i mean i grew up in this industry so i you know i saw my dad in the 70s and 80s you know struggle through when it was you know ugly in the 90s you know it wasn't too bad but then around 2000 it hit another wall like i've, I've kind of lived through them all you just kind of ride them you know and that's i've been doing it for 34 years i've been driving so i mean it's it's nothing new here really I think that's interesting being that, you know, much like myself, I grew up in trucking, you did too. So what's some of the things that you've implemented that has caused, caused you to still be here where others aren't that successful right now? I'm a penny pincher. I don't, uh, I don't get loose with the money. Uh, the biggest splurge I do is new trucks, uh, new trailers. But other than that, they're always spec for fuel efficiency, trying to get the money back uh, to basically make the payment. Uh, we don't do chrome. We don't do, you know, extras. We just get a nice clean truck and, and then we try to run a, an efficient business, try to do everything we can. But that's, like I said, I grew up when that was the thing you did. You know, it wasn't a huge stretch for me. Uh, being a young man, I always monitored my fuel efficiency. So even when I didn't have a truck, so then once I got a truck, you know, that just made sense to me. So we do the same thing everywhere, yeah, whether it is uh, the, the fuel efficiency, whether it's the maintenance, whether it's, you know, just name it. We're constantly going through it and being like, what can we shave off? What can we do different? Where can we trim? So and that's business survival, you know? Yeah, well, it's smart business. And it seems like you put an emphasis on savings and efficiencies, which is something that a lot of people overlook in my experience when I'm consulting with them, you see a lot of inefficiencies. Um, but, you know, say you figure out the fuel, say you figure out the cost savings, there's still other factors at play people, you have to deal with people, you know, I imagine like that, that's a pain point or uh, a success story, depending on how you play it. And how many people do you got working with you right now? Oh, we got 10 drivers. So yeah, it's well, you were saying earlier that a good driver or a bad driver can make or break you. Um, that's why we got to be super selective when we're this small, one bad driver can really bring you down. Especially if they hit a hundred thousand dollar bridge. Yeah, right. That would be devastating. That would be a game changer right there. Right. So when you're selecting these drivers, I mean, are you personally talking to them? Are you personally interviewing each person that comes aboard? Yeah, I go through and, um, uh, my wife usually does the first interview, uh, just goes over their application. And then I follow up with like what they have for knowledge in the trucking industry, you know, where, uh, you know, what they've done and how they've done it. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's easy to spot a, a, a BSer in that group. You know, if, you know, when you've done it your whole life, if someone's telling you, you know, this and that, and, and it's easy when you're an office person to kind of like, Oh, okay, that sounds good. But then when I hear it, I'm like, well, wait a minute, what happened in this little time segment here where you, you know, managed to drive a hundred thousand miles in six weeks. How'd that happen? I mean, so I imagine between crunching the numbers, being as efficient as possible on the fuel, the costs and the spending and investing into your business. Sounds like all the money you save, you invest back into your growth. So obviously you're trying to grow and you're being very cautious on how you grow. Do you think that's something that a lot of people get wrong? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm new to this really. Uh, when it comes to growth. So, yeah, I started with one, grew to two, then to three, then to four, and then we added three. So then we jumped to seven, and then we added another three, and then we jumped to nine. Now we just got another new truck getting us to 12 here recently. So it's it's definitely a, a small progression. It feels like a lot because you're doubling at this size. But now we're just going to try to stick with 12, see if we can't get this for the next couple of years, really kind of get it rocking and then go from there, you know, survive this downturn, so to speak, and, uh, you know, build our relationships. You know, everyone preaches about relationships, but that's the that's the God honest truth right there is finding people to work with and and, and being there when they need you the most. That's when, you know, those relationships are built. Uh, so we're going to focus on that. 
that sounds like you have a solid plan and you're doing it smart where a lot of people let the greed take over or just see it as a money grab opportunity and they have some half concocted idea of success. Sounds like you found the map to success that works for you and that's being smart about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there's there's plenty of opportunity here to to um, misuse the situation, uh, take advantage of it, uh, but that only gets you one one uh, one load or one situation and then you burn it uh so i try to focus on you know what's to me it's a 20-year plan i got 20 years till i retire and then so i figure for the next 20 years i'm trying to build this thing so i want to have these relationships for 20 years i want to work with the same people i know it doesn't always work that way that's business uh 101 but even in the trucking industry the, the it's funny because the people we started out with three years ago, we built relationships with, they're not even in our life right now. Like they've come and they've gone and we've moved on to other people, but now we've kind of grown a network that's, you know, we, we've got several brokers, several customers that we work with constantly fluctuating in and out, whether they're busy or whether they're slow. So it's learning a lot. I am learning an absolute, a lot about the industry way more than just the driving. The driving is actually the easy part. It's everything else that comes with it that makes it really difficult. So it's a, it's a good learning curve for me. So before we let you go, most important question of the show, do you think Josh has a future in brokerage wearing that tracksuit? Of course he does. That's all it takes. I feel like I need a Rolex on to really complete the outfit, but that's just me. That sells it. Jamie, if someone wanted to work with you guys, if someone wanted to talk to you or most of all do business with you, where could they find you? You can find me on all social media as Hell Bent Hagen. And I am on LinkedIn as well, Jamie Hagen on LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, but Instagram, TikTok, all that jazz, it's all, in, you know, Hell Bent Hagen. So hit me up. Well, thanks for coming on the show and sharing your experience and be safe out on the road. Will do. Thanks, guys. Well, that's a wrap. Uh, you know, the next two weeks we'll be showing different things that are happening here at Matt. So definitely want to tune in for all those segments and uh, look forward to seeing you there. Uh, other than that, thank you for tuning in to Cents Per Mile. I'm your host, Charles Gracie. And I'm your co-host, Paul Gibson. See you next time. is great for logistics and supply chain management. You have the port, which is one of the largest import ports here in the country. The pillars of this program, the things that we really focus on are uh, logistics technology, data analytics, and uh, the third is the business acumen and, and the industry connections. It's a 10-month program, and the amount of information that is uh, covered throughout that time is pretty amazing. The FIU Business School is unique in the sense that it teaches you leadership subtly in a way that you don't even know that you're actually learning. A lot of our professors have um, strong industry connections. 
and we're constantly trying to make sure that students are presented to companies uh, that are actually working within this space. One of the things that I'm proudest of is how we help train our students to enter the workforce. Um, and this goes beyond just what they're learning in the classrooms. We are Florida International University and this program reinforces that international part, which I think is a really uh, kind of great learning experience for the students to get exposed to what these industries are like in different parts of the world. If you're interested in this program, do it. Don't second guess it. I am very grateful and proud of it. Sirius XM, welcome live audience, welcome on-demand audience, welcome Sirius XM radio audience. What a week, this is Matt's week, by the way. Are you gearing up? Are you packing? I gotta get it, I gotta head down there with the team from Truck Parking Club at like 5.30 in the morning on Wednesday. I'm excited though, it's gonna be a good time. I think I'm like in Kentucky till Sunday too. So it'll be really good if you're gonna be there, let me know, DM me, t uh, at Timothy Dooner on Twitter, all those kind of things. I'm looking forward to it. We have an awesome show today. We got a headline to start out with. Not a good one to kick off the week, by the way. Hope you all had a good St. Patrick's Day. Let's check it out here. Flock Freight has some layoffs coming up. That's right, Grace Sharkey has the story. It says here, Friday marked a turn of events for Flock Freight, a provider of shared truckload solutions as the company decided to reduce its workforce by 54 individuals. The company's last reported layoffs were around this time last year in April of 2023. They said the strategic move was aimed at calibrating the company's trajectory towards profitability. The positions affected were primarily back office roles, roles focused on enhancing automation for Flock's operational efficiency Efficiencies. Their founder made a comment to Freightways, their co-founder and CEO, Oren Zelansky, said, the people supporting our customers and carriers are those building the IP have not been affected. Uh, these moves have put us in a position where our path to profitability can be measured in months, not years. I guess they're maybe seeing that happen this year. But according to PitchBook data, Flock's most recent round of fundraising came in 2021. It was a Series D. It was led by SoftBank Investment Advisors for $215 million. They were a unicorn. They were worth one point. $3 billion at a time, but not everyone's happy with this company. Molo co-founder Andrew Silver said, and they just laid more people off yesterday. The only positive of this awful market sustaining so long is it hopefully takes out a lot of trash in this space. Wow. Big comments out of uh, Andrew Silver over there. Not happy with it, but hey, hope everything works out for the people that are still with Flock and maybe they'll get set road to profitability like they said. Speaking of shots fired, take a look at this unique method for strapping a container over here, roll the tape. Look at this, this guy's got some kind of strapping gun, some kind of strapping cannon, strap confetti. Robert Cox says, I always wear a hard hat when throwing or removing straps, or I'm near someone that's just throwing straps. You know, if you, for example, I couldn't find this exact strap worker, but I did find this thing called the Nancy. Take a look at this. If you have like a chuck it for your dog, this is a similar idea, except you throw your straps over the top of the container, like a chuck it in case uh, your arm is messed up. It says over, it's 135 bucks, by the way. It says with our strap thrower, no more flipping straps to get them to line up with the winch. No more straps getting hung up on the top of the load. Odd shaped loads are a cinch after tossing a couple straps with a Nancy strap thrower, you'll be able to lay the strap exactly where you want. Order yours today and save your back, wrists, and elbows and your shoulders from being sore. Invented by a fellow trucker. Now, why is this thing called the Nancy and why does that logo have a tutu on it? Well, it was founded by a guy named Dave Johnson who's a flatbedder and he said he could not come up with a name. He asked his entire family, he put a $50 bounty on the name and eventually his younger sister said, hey, why don't you just name it after me? So it got stuck with the Nancy and he said, yeah, it sounds like what you call someone who like, you know, who's a sissy and can't throw. Although is that the best marketing? I don't know. I don't know. Hell Ben Hagen said he's gonna get one though. Maybe they'll send these at Matt's. I can try one out for you. Hey, speaking of Matt's, coming right up, Road to Matt's. We're gonna be doing Truck What the Truck live on Friday. There's no show on Wednesday. We'll be live on Friday, though, for Matt's. We'll be too busy driving over there, setting up all that stuff. We're gonna get social content, though, so follow me on social, follow What the Truck on social. But we'll be live at noon at Truck Parking Club's booth at 66232. Come, come on by. That'll be 12 Eastern time. Then at 5 p.m. Eastern, we're gonna be on the Sirius XM stage doing a live What the Truck 
on radio. It's going to be an awesome time. By the way, March Madness also kicks off this week. Carrie Jablonski from Trucker Tools, former Weather Truck guest, she was just on here last week. She posted this. She posted some great facts about this. She said there's 136 teams, 68 men, 68 women. They travel across the country starting tomorrow night for games over the next three weeks at 33 different locations. If you're in logistics, just think about all of the struggle it takes to pull that off. And here's some of the facts that she pulled out. She said the only city to host both men's and women's games in the first round of the tournament this year, Spokane, Washington. Because brackets are meant to be busted, the final four basketballs with the team's logos on them, those when they send, those are last mile just in time. Custom critical UPS sent. They was recorded right uh, as the um, the final four is declared. So as you can already tell, that's going to be kind of hell. This year, the men's final four is in Glendale, Arizona. Now, there's some amazing amount of stuff that it takes to put all this stuff together. She says it takes dozens of truckloads, including 5,000 portable platforms just for the floor, 20,000 temporary seats, and a 700 pound scoreboard it takes about two weeks to set all of that up you out there who are you rooting for i gotta go with i gotta go with the vols i gotta go with rocky top right advisor over there gotta go with tennessee volunteers gotta go with the home team all right on episode 695 of what the truck i'm talking to fmc commissioner carl benzel we're diving into a little bit about the red sea conflict we'll be talking about safe passage and trade panama canal water levels a little bit about u.s ports detention and demerge a lot to get in with carl we have so creep capital founder kevin nolan he's doing his best elvis impression as he talks about the brokerage casino can brokers really beat the house? No one's taking a ton of gambles in the industry. We're going to find out what worked, what didn't. How about founders? Kevin's a fascinating guy. It'll be a good time. we got Traveler Scott Pipicelli. He's talking about trucking insurance losses and the tech that can help prevent them. Plus, plenty of other stuff. And I just heard the door. That might be Kevin. He'll be on in just a bit. But right now, we got Carl Benzel, Commissioner, Federal Maritime Commission. Sir, great to see you again. Hey, nice to see you again. It's been too long. It's been too long, sir. Where are you sitting today? I'm at home, so I'm working from home. Uh, I try to go in the middle of the week uh, and uh, Mondays and, and Fridays uh, work from home. Well, 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 looking good, looking good. What's on the desk of the FMC commissioner today? Well, I'm doing a lot of paperwork. The government has too much paperwork, so I, uh, I'm trying to catch up on stuff uh, like that. Uh, I am uh, also looking at the issues at the Red Sea and the Panama Canal and, and you know, whether or not we should try to take some action uh, to uh, trade actions in response to uh, uh, the terrorist attacks on, on merchant shipping. And uh, so I'm also talking to the industry about how this is going to impact their operations and it just depends uh company to company yeah you know this is a year it started out it started out crazy and it's one of those things where when we had those first attacks in the red sea it was it was ominous right it was like this is not a one-off incident this is going to carry on for a long time and it, it it sort of has so much so that the news cycle it's almost been a little bit forgot about in the past couple of weeks what's happened in the red sea but there's been more attacks there's been piracy related to going around the horn there's been all sorts of issues but let's start there what's going on in the red sea and, and how is the fmc looking at this so it's uh you know it's it's amazing really goes back i think the last time you've seen something like this was 1805 with the barbary pirates when they were uh, attacking uh, merchant shipping and uh, uh, essentially the Houthis are, are uh, using their terrain in Yemen uh, to uh, perpetuate uh, attacks. The technology is, is, is easy to, to use, deploy, and, it, and, it, and the ocean carriers just really are not willing to risk their vessels, their operations, their merchant seamen. And so we have a situation where it's basically suspended most of the operations through the Red Sea, I think 75% uh, of the traffic that used to go from Europe uh, to Asia uh, through that uh, 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 transit uh, are, are being suspended and rerouted around Africa. So it's really creating all sorts of challenges uh, with respect to how we get our goods and our, our international trade. In international trade, safe passage is, is critical, right? Safe passage, the idea that we can order something as a shipper or a consumer, and it's actually going to come to us and not get hit by a drone or stolen by a pirate or something like that. That is essential to safe trade. In terms of your office, what are you helping to do to ensure safe passage, safe trade? 
So we're looking at this, and I personally, as, as Commissioner Bensel, I'm looking at our trade statutes. Uh, we have uh, the the uh, Foreign Shipping Practices Act and uh, something, a law called the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, that both say you can look at the actions of foreign governments to determine whether or not uh, to issue sanctions or, 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 or trade remedies to attack those practices uh, that uh, adversely uh, impact shipping in our foreign trade. So I, I am looking at that right now, uh, whether or not uh, it should be uh, deployed. It would be a, an investigation into it. Uh, there's a lot of challenges, uh, but you're right. The issues related to, um, to let me get rid of my phone. Sure. Uh, there, are, there are issues related to uh, securing uh, that uh, freedom of transit, and that's a fundamental maritime law that uh, you should have a right of innocent passage through every territorial uh, sea. And uh, Yemen uh, has uh, agreed to the international uh, law of the sea, the United Nations law of the sea. And so we're seeing a, a, a problem with respect to their ability to police uh, their waters to make sure that uh, you know, companies that are just engaging in the movement of, of cargo can uh, can continue to do that. Um, so we'll we'll see. I'm still looking at it. There's some issues related uh, to Yemen in particular because Yemen is basically uh, in a civil war. So uh, there's some questions whether and how uh, effective this could be. But I will continue to to support uh, that concept, the concept of innocent tra transit and the, and the requirements internationally to protect those. How concerned uh, is your office, how concerned are you about a potential rise in piracy by the rerouting of these vessels? You know, it is a big issue. Uh, it's amazing when the sort of uh, uh, terrorist attacks, actions, maritime attacks occur, it, it, it emboldens other uh, places. So we're seeing an incredible rise in Somali uh, piracy, uh, which uh, 